Thank you for coming, guys. And uh, this is Ksenia Norel, curator and our artist, Jaro Wyszyński Lady. And uh, I'm from the Polish Culture Institute in New York, so we proposed this programming, and I was not submitted, and Napoleon was uh, generously accepted it. So thank you very much, and yeah, enjoy the evening. Wonderful. Well, thank you. <clears throat> I Excuse me, my voice is a bit croaky because, well, all the things. But um, hopefully you hear me, um, both here and online. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I mean, this is a long time coming. Um, first and foremost, this is uh, my third time, I think, on this stage at RU, my second home. But my first time with Yell, an artist who I've been following for several years, and as a curator, it's such a gift to be asked to speak with an artist that you've actually been pining to meet, but her nomadism, in fact, I think, has been one of the reasons why we never have connected in person. I think we first knew one of one another through mutual friends in Poland, and she may have been in Poland at a time when I was traveling through Poland, but it was sort of ships passing in the night, and then we kept in touch thanks to social media, and her travels have brought her back to the back, truly to the United States, but to northern New York, where I don't often frequent. So really this has been such um, a wonderful coincidence and, and serendipity uh, for us to come together on this stage. Uh, I'm a curator, as Bartik said. Um, I am also of diaspora, of Ukrainian diaspora, and I sympathize so much with what Yael um, represents, what she thinks about very, uh, you know, seriously and intellectually, as you'll see tonight. Um, we have so many uh, topics in common, uh, including migration, motherhood, language, language learning, photography, all of these topics are going to be covered in our conversation tonight, which is going to be like a map, in a way, of Yael's journey to today, frankly, to this very moment. And this map, um, if you'll allow me to paint the picture, has many stops, and we're going to take about five stops together tonight. Um, through her journey and we're gonna go a little bit back and forth in time so buckle up um, pay attention look closely um, because her work is is really really rich and I'll be interjecting as she goes through the different projects and then at the end we're going to ask for questions from the audience and hopefully uh, organically you'll have some things to ask or perhaps even just comment, we could have a little bit of a back and forth conversation. This is a wonderfully intimate audience, intimate space, and so I hope we can feel like we're also among friends tonight and um, really enjoying one another's company because I know I, I am so, so very happy to be here tonight. So um, without further ado, I guess I'll jump into my first question, which will lead us to our first work. Um, how did we get here? Uh, I think that's, those are the lyrics from a famous song or something, but I know we're here today, you know, in New York in 2024, and we're faced with so many, um, you know, newsreels out there. There's so much going on in, in the world, in this country, in the United States, but also abroad. Um, and I'm just wondering where it all began for you. Could you tell us a little bit more about your background, where you're from, um, yeah, where are you, where are you from? <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I would like to start first with thank you. Uh, thank you to Ksenia um, to be here with me tonight. Uh, it's a pleasure. And thank you, Bartek, and the Polish Institute uh, for Culture in New York. Um, it's a great honor to be here. Um, we made all the, tra all the tr journey to travel from Ithaca um, for a few days, and it's um, nice and overwhelming to be back in the city. Uh, I'm three months postpartum, so <laughs> it's the first time to be on stage, and it's really nice. So 
Um, going back to your question, where are you from? I would like to answer this question um, with a fragment from a lecture performance that I've given in Graz, um, in Austria, a few years ago during a residency that I did there. Um, and perhaps it will answer this question or will bring us into a more, uh, few more questions. So um, I would like to start this presentation by shortly introducing myself, um, as perhaps it is necessary in order to understand how I did metaphorically end up, um, not here, but in a place called Judenburg in Austria. When you meet a new person, what is the second question you ask them after, what's your name? Where are you from? The answer to that question will briefly reveal the background of your interlocutor. When I arrive to a new place and I'm being asked this question, I get confused and pause before I answer according to what I think would be the simplest answer that would suit the momentum of the conversation as the real answer usually requires hearing my life story. I have three passports. I was born in the United States, in New York. I grew up in Tel Aviv, Israel, Palestine. And in the past uh, decade, I used to live in Poland and now I'm back in the US for two years already. Um, I have no one simple answer to the question, where are you from? It's complicated. I know I'm not special and there are so many such complicated stories, but since I'm very much critical towards all these three countries, I don't feel at home in any of them. It's particularly hard for me to answer that question. Um, I would like to speak about the wandering Jew. Yes, I think that my Jewish identity, although I am a secular Jew, is what helps to soothe a little bit this identity crisis that evokes each time I am being asked, where are you from? But is it a character to identify with? I heard the term several times as a provocative comment after I revealed my complicated story and multiple passports, something like, a real wandering Jew with three passports ready to take over the world. I started questioning the term I thought of all my life to be rather a neutral one, and I discovered a whole legend. Um, but before presenting the medieval legend of the wandering Jew, I would like to talk about the um, tra Trades Kantiam plant, the three species from the genus. Uh, the Palida, Tebrina, and Fluminesis are also <coughs> called in a non-scientific language, both in English and in Hebrew, and perhaps in other languages too, the wandering Jew. In Israel, where I grew up, this plant is very popular and is also called this way apparently because it, of its ability to spread over white territories. This usage is not in itself an evidence of anti-Jewish prejudice, as this name is used also in Israel. Nevertheless, there is an effort to change this nickname as it is quite controversial when one think about that. Actually, I've seen um, in like, Ithaca suburbs in Trumansburg in a cafe, um, the wandering dude. <laughs> so <laughs> it's an interesting, uh, funny comment. Um, and this is also how I discovered Judenborg and it coat of arms. It might, it might sound foolish, but this is uh, how it occurred. At the beginning of my residency in Graz, after many meetings with new people, where the question, where are you from, was being asked again and again and again, I got confused and had to decide each time how to answer that simple yet complicated question. I recalled the wandering Jew, the plant, and I decided I had to get one to my room at the priestess seminar to accompany me on this new adventure. Yet instead of searching for its scientific name, I somehow simply put in Google Translate the three words, the wandering Jew, and inserted the translation, the Wander, the Wander Jude plus the word Steiermark, mm into Google's search bar, only to discover the Wikipedia page, Geschichte der Juden in der Steiermark. 
the history of the Jews in uh, Steiermark. Where Judenborg is mentioned, and there is a picture of it coat, it coat of arms. Uh, the one we, we, we were um, discussing during um, this lecture performance. Um, eventually, I did find the Sabina plant in Styria, and as a closure, I took cuttings of it, um, and uh, people at the um, talk could take one. Uh, I would have done it the same here, but no time with the baby. Um, so, yeah, some of my friends there in Graz are still growing. They're wandering Jews that I um, gave them. And um, I, I, I did um, start this project with uh, Judenborg coat of arms um, because I was critical towards this image. Um, it's still, this is a contemporary coat of arms of a town in Austria, and I felt uh, very intimidated. Um, when I saw that. And so um, I uh, kind of embarked on this um, research, like very historical academic research. Um, and all that happened very organically because um, it was not my initial plan to, um, to embark on this project and you know meet the um, mayor of this town and kind of like start a whole uh, political slash academic discussion on that um, history um, but somehow I was granted this residency um, with a plan uh, to do a completely different project which I'm going to show um, uh, also tonight but but it was just there. I mean, I found it, and I guess I found it because I was very much attracted to, um, you know, finding things that I could relate to. Uh, so, um, of course, I, I can say that anything Jewish, you know, um, would be um, perhaps a kind of um, a reference point because, um, a as I just described, this is... Um, I guess an anchor in my identity, although I'm not religious. But um, yeah, so that so so that's um, I guess one project that I wanted to uh, present here today, and um, uh, it had uh, somehow I was continuing it because I was coming back to Graz, um, and I spent there um, a little bit more than uh, half a year uh, altogether, and kind of I keep going back because I. Um, did a lot, I kind of like started a lot of different projects and made a lot of connections and so um, I feel in a way like at home also there um, <coughs> and I wanted to um, kind of also explore the, the place with my kind of Mediterranean or like Middle Eastern um, identity and so I have this funny Orient hat that um, I was wearing, uh, and I was asking different um, people to take my picture, like as being a tourist there. So, like, kind of um, to have this very short, timely performance that um, I'm posing as a tourist, um, but I try to have um, someone else whom I don't know if they were locals or tourists or just passers-by to have this kind of like orient gaze towards me. Mm -hmm. um, so that was um, a performance that I did um, there that was kind of like <laughs> connected to um, the history of this coat of arms and especially like the whole thing with the hat mm -hmm. of the Jew. Um, I mean, it's not just a big nose that kind of like is very stereotypical, but it's also like the um, history of the hat. And um, I mean, it's, it has a lot of other details that I'm not going to go into, but um, somehow like to kind of contemporize that or um, try to redefine that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a very simple question about this project. Um, how aware were these people of your performance or was it only you who were 
was aware of the performance. Yeah, it, um, I, it was very like a short um, connection. Mm -hmm. um, I was go, walking with um, this possible camera and asking mm. people to take my picture when I was posing next to different uh, places, um, like very kind of touristic places around Steiermark. So mm -hmm. not only in Graz, but um, all around the region. Okay. Um, yeah, it's just really interesting sort of thinking about consciousness in this context, right? You were so hyper-conscious of this history, of this coat of arms, and, you know, its iconography, and you sort of adopted that, right? Modernized it, contemporized, contemporized it into, you know, your cool hat and, <laughs> you know, your own, you know, self. But... Um, yeah, I think it's it's really this level of consciousness that you brought to the project and to your, in, that you bring generally to your work that's very interesting. Um, yeah, so I think, um, I mean, one of the premises that was guiding me th through this project is that um, it, I mean, I was there um, a little bit after, one year after the pandemic, so like still during the mm. pandemic, and um, it was like my first travel um, for pretty long time. I mean, I literally moved there, um, and I, I mean, I, I was living in Poland and kind of like also was a long time I was not visiting my parents, for instance, and my, I think, um, I, I also finished my master's at the time, my studies, and like I, I didn't have like a solid ground, um, mm -hmm. and I felt like Earth was trembling. I mean, of course, there was a pandemic, sure. um, so I guess a lot of people were feeling like that. But I was really, <coughs> like, I mean, I was living there in a priester seminar. Like I had a room with a lot of young priests and students that were like you know attending the seminar, and um, that it was very surreal and also very kind of like um, uh, very very modest and uh, right. kind of nomadic as right. well um, and I was I asked myself and I also asked the people there um, in Judenburg I mean Judenburg this is a town of the Jews so yeah. if I am Jewish maybe this is also my town right, right. maybe I can live there too you know like it, it, that was like this kind of performative almost like kind of a joke in a mm -hmm. way but like also a serious question because I was searching right. for a place. I'm still, but and that and that brings me to you know sort of my next question and and um, a segue between one stop and the other on our journey today, which is you you talk a lot about place and the specificity of place. You know, Judenburg. Like I mean, you got to be there, right? <laughs> like city of Jews like you can't not every you know some people can claim they're very friendly to Jews and we welcome all but like this is like it's in the name it's in the code of it's like super uber official right so you know but your work is not always site specific right you're not a sculptor who goes out there and makes this you know massive installation all the time you sometimes do but but you write so you hear you're here you're working very conceptually right so um you know, and so can you just talk more about that connection to place or that seeking, you know, maybe almost like a constantly unfulfilled or sort of constantly unsatisfied, like you say, you're still looking, you know, during that pandemic time for sure. And even now you're still looking for your place. Um, how do you connect to places? How do you then move, you know, whilst trying to be connected, you kind of suddenly then go somewhere else? Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, it's first of all serendipity. Um, that's how my life has been <laughs> and work as well. So um, I think it also connected uh, with residencies. Um, so I think, uh, I mean, um, I can start um, by um, talking a little bit about uh, one of my first projects in Poland, um, which is not um, the official way. Um, or like the official reason why I moved to Poland uh, at first place that was um, exactly 10 years ago um, I was invited for a residency um, 
actually, um, it's maybe too big to say it was a residency. It was like um, a research <laughs> fellowship um, in Lublin. It's a town, it's a city uh, in uh, eastern part of Poland. And what was um, about to just be a uh, one year um, of um, research or volunteering in this cultural center, um, which is dealing with uh, Jewish um, culture and Jewish history uh, in Lublin ended up being eight years. So I, uh, I mean, I was not living in Lublin the whole time. Um, I moved um, to Warsaw and uh, traveled a lot. Um, I mean, I had the life there. I mm -hmm. you know, had a relationship. I had um, I went to, to school, mm -hmm. um, I participated in a lot of um, residencies and, um, and I think that um, this project that is called um, Intimacy um, and um, this is the first, it was my first residency I did at Pauline uh, Museum for History of Polish Jews in Warsaw. Um, and it tells the story of my uh, gra grandfather who was Polish Jewish, uh, who was born in Poland, and thanks to him, actually, I am also a Polish citizen. So um, these three passports that I'm kind of like not very proud of, usually, um, I um, gained in also this very serendipitous way. So like I was born in New York because my dad went to grad school here. So I don't have a family here right now. Um, most, my, most of my family in uh, Tel Aviv, um, Israeli passport because, well, I grew up there and uh, most of my family is there. And this Polish passport kind of like came as a surprise because I was invited for this program in Lublin. And then um, one thing led to another and I realized that I have Polish roots, um, which uh, in fact were not, I mean, I was somehow like more proud of my Ukrainian uh, babushka all my life, um, and uh, and this other like part of the family that are uh, from a kibbutz in in Israel, and this Polish grandfather of mine um, was not in the uh, kind of like my big um, you know uh, kind of. We were not even uh, able to speak because uh, he didn't learn Hebrew um, and uh, I at the time didn't speak Polish or Yiddish or Russian. That was the three languages that he spoke. And this is actually um, a very interesting document that led me to uh, make this movie. Um, so when I, uh, when I got my Polish passport, um, the person that helped me to go through this biocracy uh, found this document in the state archives. And this is a letter written by my grandfather um, who um, is, immigrated from uh, Poland after the Second World War with my mom already. My mom was born in Lviv in Ukraine and then the whole family repatriated to Poland um, and from Poland they immigrated to, um, to Israel. And he is writing this letter in Israel um, and he is saying um, that he um, was, before the Second World War, he was part of the Polish Communist Party and he would like to go back to Poland and um, leave and raise his daughters in a socialist country. So um, he's revealing uh, pretty much his um, communist identity. He's even saying that he was in the prison um, before the war and um, somehow um, kind of like the, as I learned later on, directing uh, this letter to um, the person who was with him in prison, who later on became the uh, chief secretary of the uh, of the of the state, Władysław Gomułka, and this is a very public figure. I mean, everyone in Poland know who he was, and um, it turned out that he was in uh, prison with my uh, grandfather, and um, when. When I got this Polish passport, uh, thanks to this grandfather that I've met in my life but couldn't even speak about anything with, um, and he died when I was 13, I was like, first of all, thank you, Grandpa. I mean, like, European citizenship, everyone wants it, right? Like, people fight for it. And 
Um, this and, and second thing, I was like, wow, I, I need to get to know him. Mm. And um, and so like that was what connected me to the place, to Poland. Mm -hmm. uh, literally, I mean, I had family that most of them perished in the Holocaust. But um, on the other hand, uh, I had this grandfather and I... I mean, he was alive for me as a character, but like he didn't mm. leave any memoirs. Like mm. he, uh, he never really worked in his life. Like he was very kind of troubled person. Mm. Um, I mean, co constantly being rejected from one place to another. So um, this is a, a proof that this letter was denied. I mean, he never went back to Poland and. 60 years later, I, his granddaughter, went back to Poland. Uh, yeah. I mean, back. I went to Poland and kind of like... Well, and metaphorically back, right? So for me, like, the moral of the story really is this incredible, um, like, story of proxy almost that, you know, in place of him, you went, you fulfilled his dream to go back, although Poland is not a socialist <laughs> country anymore. Right. Um, but you but fulfilled that dream and also, you know, almost in his absence or in absence of knowing him, that place literally like, you know, its territory gave you knowledge of him, <laughs> right? Indirect knowledge, of course. Like you don't know what his favorite color was. Maybe you don't know what his favorite food was, but you learned his language. <laughs> yeah. Well, perhaps you do from your, from translating or whatever. But you get what I'm saying. It wasn't like a very personal connection that you had by going back to Poland necessarily, but it's like you sort of, you know, embodied yeah. him by learning the language, by speaking the language. And so, you know, you sort of paralleled his journey in different ways. And I assume you know, that's what brought you to making this work. Yeah. So what I did actually, that that's very interesting uh, that, that you're saying that because I really wanted to get to know him. And so the, like the fact or like the dry fact, the fun fact that I knew from my aunt and my mom is that he was saying he was in prison with Gomuka. So who is this Gomuka? And then I realized it was a public figure. So I was, okay, I'm going to read his memoirs and I'm going to probably learn something a little bit about my grandfather. Right. And it turned out uh, he mentioned him in his diaries uh, from prison, this Jew he was playing chess with. And um, perhaps there were like couple Jews or some more Jews that were in the same um, environment in prison, um, but that... It, 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 it's like a trope almost. Like, yeah. So your grandfather, you know, whether that was exactly him or not is sort of beside the point, but it fulfills kind of for you, like giving him a place and a time right. and a moment, right? Which is, it must be incredibly satisfying. Um, or uh, very peculiar, I think. And I went on to uh, somehow imagine him uh, and really embody him in, in this way that um, I kind of, wrote his role in the conversation. So mm -hmm. um, what I did in this project is a 30 minute uh, long film in Polish with English subtitles. It's online. Um, you're all welcome to watch it. Um, and I did it um, at the Poly, so with the production of uh, the Pauline Museum in Warsaw, um, which was incredible. And so um, one of the things I, I chose the um, like technique of uh, shadow theater because uh, this is a little bit uh, like images from the production. It was a lot of fun to work with um, the um, actors and kind of behind the screen uh, with all the props and all this kind of like materialistic um, and uh, like very kind of a lot of uh, we work with um, uh, props and like uh, um, these small chess parts because like every little um, item and object in the script and in the scene, um, uh, uh, like in the, the scenography was like very important and very crucial um, because it was like very, uh, I mean, you, you could watch the film and, and, and see how like um, everything has a meaning um, because what I did is uh, I wrote a dialogue between these two characters, one embodies my grandfather and one Gomuka, um, in this way that they um, they kind of like um, speak from this future to the past. So 
Uh, my grandfather, like knowing this letter that he was, you know, kind of almost directing to Gomuka, it was written in 1957, so before 68, which was like the big uh, wave of um, forced migration from Poland, um, and uh, that was Gomuka that was in power at that time, so, so he's in a way responsible to that. And that was even before that, but kind of like, knowing that what happened in history, I went back and kind of like mixed past with future and created this dialogue that is like, uh, for sure, I mean, uh, like it's kind of possible to know that um, they had this relationship and he was forced uh, to leave. And um, I, I, I would make a spoiler, although um, this <laughs> you can all watch the, the film, that um, th this is a one take. So uh, it was like a theater performance that they acted behind the screen and we were filming that. Uh, we were filming the screen and what happened, and this is again like very um, serendipity, like moment of serendipity because uh, this cloth on the uh, broom um, it resembles the like kind of weirdly a little bit the shape of um, the map of um, the state of Israel. And uh, I saw that on the monitor when we were filming. I was like, please, so they would not mess up the steak. Because <laughs> that was exactly, it. it he, he's moving the broom and the cloth and then it kind of like, it took this shape, and this is the moment where Gomuka is telling, in the film, Gomuka is telling my grandfather, um, go to Birobijan, to the um, Soviet Kegusionu, the, the, the Soviet Zion. And my grandfather, who I, in a retrospective, knew was an anti-Zionist Jew, is saying, I am not a, I'm not a Zionist. And then this map is kind of like, mm. uh, because he had to be there in mm -hmm. a way that was like his uh, kind of unfortunate mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, fate in mm -hmm. a way, because mm -hmm. he, he, he tried to go to Germany to seek work and he had to go back after half a year because like he didn't have money anymore, he couldn't mm -hmm. find. And my grandmother was like this strong figure and she was, uh, no, we're staying here. And mm -hmm. she was working, she was taking care of the, the girls, of my mom and my aunt, and he was right. just kind of like silent shade, uh, shadow almost. Well, sure, I mean, yeah, life takes twists and turns and different, you know, crossroads. You have different barriers put in front of you, and it sounds like, you know, for better or for worse, he ended up in Israel. And what I think is really interesting, and this could help us segue to our third stop in our tour, which is this is an this is an incredible work that's incredibly personal on one hand, right? It's your grandfather and your story, right? And they're all they're both you know enmeshed in one another. His desire to return, your return, but of course, I mean, I'm sure many people can see themselves in this. Can this is this film, and I think it's so beautiful that you've chosen the silhouette, um, you know, puppet puppet silhouette or, or however you framed it exactly terminologically. A shadow theater. Shadow theater, excuse me. <laughs> uh, because it, it, it sort of allows, I think, for the viewer to to engage in that mirroring so much better, right? Because you don't actually see who the actors are. You don't see their details. They're just, you know, they're almost tropes for themselves or tropes for different people who have different kind of life stories. But let's let's take a jump to um, the third project here, which is uh, personal, of course, but also very monumental and really of the moment. So this work that we're gonna dive into um, really is about, you know, in a way, so much of the now. Um, and it was made right before the still ongoing full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Um, uh, and so what, what what is this and how did you get here um, and what were you feeling because this project changed in very unexpected ways because of what literally was happening around it like in that room that we're looking in yeah um so this is locomotiva it was my um last uh, solo show in Wrocław, um, in Poland, um, uh, Dolny Śląsk, uh, Silesia. 
Um, the gallery that um, the exhibition was uh, presented is located in the uh, in Wrocław Główne. This is the uh, main train station in uh, in Wrocław. Um, it's on the second floor. It's a beautiful space. Um, and um, th this, I had, I mean, I, I did this project in 2022, um, right before the full scale. Um, were the invasion, um, and um, I didn't plan it uh, this way, um, of course. Um, but it's also interesting, uh, like biography element here, because so uh, apparently when um, my mom was a baby, uh, she she was born in Lviv, and then they re the whole family repatriated to Poland, and from there they they continued to. Um, to Israel, and so um, they arrived in Wrocław. So they arrived from Lviv to this train station, and then um, they lived for a year um, in the suburbs of Wrocław. Um, so they they did this journey on the train, and um, and Lokomotiva. So the um, the, the project um, is. Um, it started with the, like like the inspiration with uh, for for it was um, the children educational poem by Julian Tuvim, uh, who's a Polish Jewish uh, poet and writer, um, and he wrote Lokomotiva, uh, or, or it was published in 1938, um, so right before the beginning of the Second World War and. Um, before he is forced to migrate from uh, Poland as well. And um, he, his journeys are pretty amazing um, in itself. And also uh, he arrived in the US and later on, actually he moved back to Poland. So he mm. died in Poland, mm. um, I think in the fifties, uh, mm. something like that. And so um, I heard, so, in Poland, every 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 kid um, know to recite the poem. It's like the most known poem um, that you know is super popular until this very day. And I learned that in one of my Polish courses. So I was taking so many uh, classes uh, to learn the language, um, and. I have this like beautiful memory um, of my teacher reciting the poem and I was so kind of like amazed by this very performative uh, it's it rhymes it's very theatrical um, it's very funny it's also a little bit like old-fashioned <laughs> with you know not very politically correct to some extent and um, and I always knew I wanted to do something with that and so the opportunity came that I um, got the, um, in touch with a curator at the at a gallery in the, um, uh, it's it's called the BWA um, in um, in Wrocław. It's like it's actually like a public space. Mm. So this is what is so incredible in Poland that there's so many public uh, galleries, so not private, but, mm -hmm. um, and, it, and they're really, like, usually have an amazing programming and great team, um, and so they're spread it all over the country, and... Some vestige of socialism. Oh, yeah, <laughs> definitely, and it's, and, and it's fantastic, and so I got to know this curator, and, and we started working on, on the project, and, um, um, actually, uh, we started working on that in summer 21, so that was the moment where there were a lot of um, immigrants, um, actually refugees, not immigrants, coming, um, so like actually were taken <laughs> from Belarus to um, the borders um, of the EU, uh, so Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, um, and like literally thrown in the forest and so many people died from hunger, from hypothermia, like there was a huge scandal, there were a lot of protests, there were a lot of like activism um, in Poland. I was at the time still in Austria, but um, when I when I heard that, it immediately got me back to the Middle East and um, to you know my experiences in in Israel, Palestine, and in this kind of like performative um, almost way, I knew that I want this project to also have something to do with um, um, with this um, with this issue with this 
scandal. Mm -hmm. And so we started this project in a, in this kind of social practice almost way that we collected um, a lot of um, objects, items from um, different people, like from furniture to like um, kitchen tools and um, baby car seats and um, all these uh, sleeping bags and tents and whatnot and uh, kind of like segregated it and with these materials that I build the installation later on mm. were supposed to be donated to um, refugee centers in um, uh, Silesia where um, these refugees if they would be let into uh, Poland, um, because the Polish government, of course, like didn't just let everyone in. There were like soldiers, and mm -hmm. it was like a big um, issue. And so that was like the goal. Um, and then it kind of like got um, like spread to start working with the immigrant communities in. Um, in, in, in Wrocław because Wrocław is actually like one of the biggest cities in Poland and there are a lot of um, immigrants, a lot of, it's very multicultural in fact. So there are a lot of people from Belarus, from Ukraine, um, even before the full scale war. Um, so although the like um, installation was very minimalistic, like we, we had a lot of objects donated and mm -hmm. they were kept to kind of like, um, <coughs> serve as like you know take life again not as art objects but rather like useful mm -hmm. elements for you know people's life um, I had also I wanted to kind of like work a little bit with like this um, biography so there is like a funny story about these oranges that um, I chose to kind of add um, to the installation that when my grandmother decided that she has to go from um, Ukraine through Poland to Israel was because someone had brought these orange from Jaffa, I guess, to um, Lviv, or she saw a poster. It's like the versions is still uh, not, no, 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 nobody can decide if it was a real orange or a poster that she saw. And she said that she has to go with her daughters to the you know country where there are oranges. Yeah. And, um, well, that I can imagine mm -hmm. being very, um, it's yeah, a motivating, right? Very it's, <laughs> yeah. The, I mean, of course it was like propaganda, uh, but that like, you know, as a person who survived the Holocaust in, um, in, not, not in like somewhere far in the Soviet Union and she kind of like was a survivor. She, you know, sure. had to like kind of get attached to something and say right. and that, that, that spirit, was these oranges. Right, and that spirit very much is embodied by, by mm -hmm. this work. Um, but so mm -hmm. could you talk a little bit more about like how you pivoted with this work? Like, you know, like talk about an artist having a vision and then sort of like what what's the unintended, like the unintended coming, coming out of it? Yeah, um, so uh, perhaps I'll, I'll just show a little bit um, kind of more images uh, from the work and some of um, like other um, bits and pieces of inspiration. So um, it was very kind of like also I I was working on this piece in a very <coughs> serendipity kind of way because I didn't know what objects we will get. Um, I was working with an architect to build this shape, like the foundation of the locomotive from recycled materials and then like adding different things. And um, one of another um, interesting uh, point of reference was uh, May Day in New York. So kind of like bring, bring us a little bit back to uh, here and now, although a couple hundred years ago. So I guess everyone know May Day uh, in, uh, in New York, like moving day. So like the hustle bustle of the city. Um, everyone is moving because the rent is increasing so like and you could see these um, you know people schlepping like um, pianos and whatnot and so like I, I kind of wanted to um, like also imagine we had a amazing piano donator was really incredible um, and you know suitcases and just like all these things that we got um, that I wanted to kind of like tie together and have this um, almost like 
as a May Day um, reference. And um, I, I actually, I studied here uh, for a little bit less than a year as a um, um, visiting student at Cooper Union. And like in New York in you know my 20s, I had to move from one apartment to the other, uh, from uh, Lower East Side to Alphabet City. And I remember it was like a really great memory that I have that my friend from Cooper um, took the cart from the shop, sculpture shop and slapped it all the way to Lower East Side to help me move my bed. And we were like, you know, riding it through Alphabet City. Uh, <laughs> And that was like, uh, you know, this kind of like New York of someone's 20s, you know, in, in um, that was at the beginning of the 2000s. So, so that, so I had this memory myself and I wanted to kind of like um, recreate that. And, um, and another thing that uh, perhaps will um, also lead us to um, the next project and to what happened with this, um, with this installation very fast, um, I chose to work um, with a lot of dictionaries and language books. So we, we did get um, these also as donation and somehow like uh, I feel that the language element also the, the way that I came to get to, to know this poem, the locomotive, um, uh, was through language and language course. So I wanted to work with dictionaries and so I chose to kind of like balance my um, hay piles wheels of the locomotive with uh, uh, Słownik, the dictionaries of uh, like Polish English, Polish French, Polish Ukrainian, Russian, there were different kind of that we got um, and, um, and yeah and I mean they ended up being like extremely needed. Um, so um, here, this is another part of the installation uh, from the other side. This is actually um, like a blanket and a pillow that um, my siblings and I had as um, kids um, in our childhood home. And I kind of wanted to um, also delegate into the, the, the installation and, um, and I mean, it kind of like connected for me with this like educational aspect of um, the poem that it rhymes, that it like, uh, you know, you need to count all the elements that are being added to the locomotive. Um, so somehow like these numbers and very like colorful animals um, <coughs> were an important addition. And, um, and then what happened uh, a week after we opened the show um, was the invasion on the 24th um, of February. So we have like um, a little bit after the two years anniversary, it's really hard to believe that it's still going on. And since the gallery is located at the train station, um, there were thousands of people, thousands of people coming to the train station um, on, the day after already. Um, so what, I mean, there were like few days of like shock and kind of like understanding what to do uh, or like kind of trying to figure out, but the immediate um, kind of almost um, a very like impulsive uh, decision of me and the gallery team was to close the show mm -hmm. um, because the space was needed. So the first, I mean, that that's the like uh, gallery technician um, who's just like you know covering up the installation. We had the uh, Ukrainian flag uh, hanging on it, um, and then the situation became even more um, kind of hardcore and uh, difficult. So like there was a need to really like accommodate people in the gallery space. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's it's really hard to talk about it because it was I, I was working with a lot of people who their families were like um, on the journey, like coming to Wrocław and in kind of like seeking what to do and where to go, and that was the that that was like the there were like babies sleeping there. I mean. 
it, it was not like situation for like month, but like there were there was a week of people constantly coming, and that was the first like stop that they um, that they had before they would like continue to other cities or other countries. Mm -hmm. But you know, Poland border with Ukraine, like they were they just hopped on the train and um, and I mean like I, I, this is. It's like the, you know, when truth is stranger than fiction in, in, mm -hmm. in a way. But like thinking about it, that this is the exact same journey my mom did mm -hmm. as, a, um, as a baby um, from Lviv to Wrocław. And then there are so many people literally like escaping war. Um, I mean, it's really, it's just... Uh, yeah, I mean, suffice it to say, I mean, history, unfortunately, always does repeat itself. So, um, you know, to, again, your work to capture this incredibly powerful mirroring and sort of parallelism is, is I mean, unexpected. But as an artist, to be faced with sort of this pivot, I mean, I think is, is very, uh, you, know, I, you know, I think it's unique and it's important and how you handled it, it was... Um, you know, very, very, very good, very brave, and, and very, um, yeah. I, I mean, it's, a, it's just important for me to say that I definitely, I mean, I don't think, or I don't want it to, you know, I'm not making use of that um, as, as in, you know, this is like incredible. This is not incredible. I wish it was not happening. Of course, of course. I wish it was um, different and my show was, uh, you know, uh, would continue through the whole uh, month and a half that it should have been up and there would be this public uh, educational program and everything would be different. But this is uh, what happened. What I did um, is after we closed the exhibition uh, completely and the, everything was dismantled and actually all these items were like the baby car seat immediately was uh, given to you know bring babies from the border the sleeping bags to soldiers um, everything was needed like all the this blanket was given to a kid um, I I really tried not to be sentimental about it like kind of being really cold <coughs> um, in I mean, of course, this is really um, this is this is a terrible situation that still continues. And um, yeah, I guess I just mean there's like sort of a very unexpected literalness to like what you initially were talking about in literal ways, of course, but it still was distanced and abstract. Whether it was the Bella, like the relationship with Belarus, you know, that mm -hmm. parallel, or with your own life, then suddenly it becomes so incredibly, impossibly real and impossibly present. Um, and I think that's kind of rare sometimes for art in general to be so incredibly palpable, right? You know, undeniably and irrevocably like present. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I think I, at, at that time and still now, I kind of like want to distance myself from that because it's still like a, I have um, my closest friends in, in Ukraine, um, and the situation there continued to be horrific. Um, so I'm kind of like try, trying to um, not, not to think about this like physical outcome, but what I did after the show closed um, and uh, the, there was not, we were not able to continue with the public program in the space of the gallery. I um, kind of like, redirected it and invited um, my friends, uh, Ukrainian artists, to um, take the stage and speak about um, their work or about the situation um, within like a Zoom conversation that we mm -hmm. had instead of the exhibition. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like still continuing this like um, train mm -hmm. moving or writing um, just with Ukrainian voices of female artists. Um, mm -hmm. And these talks are where we, we had them in English, they're still online. Um, it, was, uh, it was very comforting because it, it enabled, um, some of them were um, uh, already in Poland at the time or um, 
in or on the way to other countries, uh, Austria as well. And we felt a little bit like a community, like uh, supporting each other in this hard moment. And um, we were invited. So it's like, again, this very like serendipitous moment. We were invited for a panel um, in also um, online in Ireland. Mm -hmm. So these like um, actions had some continuation mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. It was kind of very comforting, um, right? Right, like reverberations. Yes, almost. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so just being conscious of time, I know we want to talk about two projects, and in fact, I can I think we can I can couch my questions about both of them sort of in one, and perhaps yeah. you can move through them um, quite smoothly. I mean, I think it's undeniable that you work a lot with photography, but I'd like to say that you sort of you use, but you also. Um, misuse photography in a way too in a, in a clever way because you're not a traditional photographer it's not necessarily you know a, a camera in a dark room or a digital setup like you're often finding photographs reappropriating photographs recontextualizing photographs so you have this very interesting relationship to the medium of photography that I'd love for you to to sort of explain, and then of course it's impossible to not go back to talking about language, right? So the Slovniki, like the the dictionaries in that last um, you know full scale installation was were amazing, um, and you've spoken so much about how language inflects your your life, but also your art practice, um, you know, and it makes me think about how native language is also can be known as mother tongue, but mm -hmm. also can be known as father tongue, but there's this sort of parental uh, connection with, with speaking certain languages, and it also thereby suggests a genetic component to language, um, you know, coming from your mom or coming from your father. Um, and so, yeah, you, you, we could go into also talking more about language too. So you could sort of take your pick. We could talk about photography, we could talk mm. about language, we talk about both. And then of course we could just then open it up to questions as well. For yeah, uh, so I'll try to be very quick. So um, pretty much like what I very quickly um, went through right now uh, was my one of my earliest works um, that I did still in Jerusalem during my um, bachelor of studies at the Academy of Art there. Uh, after I came back from New York, uh, from my time in Cooper Union, and um, I studied photography there. I was like assigned to the department of photography, but I don't like cameras. <laughs> I, I'm a technophobe. I always uh, kind of delegate when I need to do things. And so um, the only image that I had in my exhibition was a um, archival photograph of my grandfather um, who I had a vision of this image and I kind of the all the only thing I had to do is find it in his archive again in a very serendipitous way and uh, flip it from left to right using uh, Photoshop so um, so that was like my beginning of working with archival um, okay. materials. I also, uh, during my time at Cooper, I was um, very fascinated by the works of Walid Rad and was sure. um, so so kind of opened up the whole idea of an archive or like a, a fictive archive and mm. working with um, archival material with history, but also with like um, fiction um, and with my own biography and kind mm. of like start to dig um, that would happen, that would brought me. Uh, the series of the watches was um, after, so um, af right after I graduated, my maternal grandmother died and my paternal grandfather died in like proximity of like few days. And so they were both collecting things. And so they had both of them, these like series of watches. And so I kind of like mixed and matched uh, and kind of tried to stop time in a way through scanning them. Um, but also that was brought me to language because so my um, they were like <coughs> completely so my grandmother was this immigrant from Ukraine and um, she didn't really speak Hebrew and this grandfather um, that you could see in this image right here um, was um, the it's a little bit hard to see but he's this kind of like pioneer who found a kibbutz and um, was like very connected to the earth later on I mean he 
really changed his uh, his mind um, about about the whole thing, uh, even publicly. Um, so so they were like really different. But she uh, wrote these diaries um, in Yiddish, and so that was like the kind of a catalyst for me to go and learn this language that I didn't know. Uh, and I took this course in Yiddish to read her diaries. Turned out she wrote about her diet, not very interesting, but like it kind of like opened this like window of Yiddish uh, for me, which was actually what brought me to Poland because um, when I started this uh, fellowship in Lublin, it was because they were looking for an artist who speak Yiddish. Uh, and that's why they invited me. So like this, it was this Yiddish, the language of um, diaspora mm. that has no state or country uh, that brought me uh, to my, um, in a way, uh, land of ancestors. Uh -huh. um, and so this language is really important. Unfortunately, I then learned Polish and then I forgot all my Yiddish and then <laughs> German came into picture, and I uh, cannot really um, speak Yiddish right now, but um, but still, it's like one of my favorite languages. And um, yeah, and and this like last work um, is um, again with the shadow uh, theater. Y yeah, um, it's based on um, a very uh, funny. So I did it in in, in Graz. Um, Graz is basically in the border between. Um, it's, right on the border between Austria and Slovenia. And so like I wanted to kind of imagine this borderland um, mixture of German and Slovene. And so we, uh, I worked with um, several linguists and artists and um, cultural animators and we were, we, we kind of phrased this um, new language that is based on German and Slovene and kind of connected and that was like a, it's a 10 minute video uh, where they kind of learn or teach these um, invented language and it's based on this uh, very um, kind of iconic uh, TV show for children to, uh, that teaches uh, Hebrew actually so that was from the 80s and this is like one of my kind of first memories of TV um, learning Hebrew myself and learning how to read and, and write. So I kind of wanted to recreate it just with like a different language mm -hmm. um, that only people who are um, like positioned in a certain geographical place are or can be connected to. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we exhibited it in uh, really the, the gallery is like a very low tech presentation during a summer festival right on the border uh, between this is a village that half of it is in Slovenia and half of it is in Austria so it's kind of like right on the border a liminal space a very liminal space and also the only place where um, this work could really be understood um, yeah. so outside of this geographical space it has very little meaning in a way. Mm -hmm. mm. mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> so that was a lot for, for a tight hour. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I would like to say thank you, Yael, um, and thank you to Residency and Polish Institute um, and to all of you. And so now I'd like to turn it to you all and give you all a chance now that you've taken this whirlwind journey with us to um, maybe make some comments or ask some questions or share your story. Um, anyone have anything to share? Well, in looking at the picture of the exhibit at the train station, after a while seeing all those cots and everything, it's like they became part of the exhibition. I mean, they kind of blended in. If somebody wandered in, and didn't know what had happened, they would have thought it was part of the uh, installation. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, like, and, and I respect your sort of humbleness in, your, you know, and it's a very sensitive topic, and I think you're, you handle it extremely well, but, you know, from a art, you know, kind of an art historical or art critical point of view, it is, it is a really, I think, powerful example of an artwork that 
you know, kind of transcends a quote unquote art with a capital A context and, you know, lives within, you know, a space that is incredibly active and incredibly, you know, um, urgent. Yeah, I just, um, I mean, one could like think that I might like, you know, benefit out of that as oh, a no. cultural capital, no, but no. this is really not. No, no. Uh, I mean, I, I show it because I think it's like, you know, the kind of next phase of the, because this is what happened, but I, that I, I don't think I would like, if I wouldn't show it, I mean, maybe the story would not be complete because sure. that's how it turned out. Yeah. But it's not that I'm like, oh, wow, it's so amazing. I mean, sure. this is not amazing. This of is horrible. Not. Of course not. And yeah. it was obviously not intended. Yeah, yeah. There was no yeah. on your part. Right, right, of course. right. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt that it's very improvised. And my question would be like about your family. How they take your this interest and in, on these discoveries and your interpretation or of the, your past, I mean your family past, how they, what's their reaction? Um, yeah, it's a good question. <coughs> <coughs> um, it's, again, it is very, uh, also, family ties are also very complicated always in every family. Um, I think they're, right now they're pretty uh, used to it. Um, when I was working on my grandfather's um, project, it was really hard for my mom because um, she kind of, that was the moment when she realized that she never asked um, him. Mm -hmm. And um, that was really hard for her to help me or provide me with information because she simply didn't know. Mm. Um, and, and, I, and I think my work um, made my family be a little bit more conscious about, uh, about the past, about their past, about the family or um, the kind of like acknowledging the diaspora because um, in every project, I think that I kind of suggest um, that the, my existence, my family existence, the Jewish existence um, is dependent on the diaspora. Because um, in every project, I in a way deny or kind of confront the um, like idea of a nation state um, and kind of denounce that also in my presence because I, I, I don't live where I grew up. I don't live where my family is. I denounce this place. So I think, I mean, it's not that this is a new like performative existence or anything, but like this is just life. Mm -hmm. um, but this is also what my work is about. And I think they kind of like, in a way came into terms with that, that I am digging, you know, that I would just mm. go and, and dig and find something which might be interesting or might not, but... And painful. And painful, of course. But. It's very personal and you, I think it's very, like, I don't know if, it's very psychological, you know, like, if, like therapy kind of mm -hmm. approach to the past. Mm -hmm. It's what you showed us, it's like the journey through geography, but time. Mm -hmm. How it's like you know Ukraine and Russia, Israel and Palestine, mm -hmm. like now immigration that we face in America, South mm -hmm. and your story of your, you know, like it's, it's the history repeating itself, but also it's it's quite like right or geopolitics and 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 things as well, yeah. Yeah, and interesting, you said history repeat itself because that's it. That is when I interviewed both my mom and my aunt about my grandfather, they both said that that's what he was saying uh, constantly. That, that was his kind of phrase that he was saying, history always repeats itself. And I kind of implemented it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, part, it's a fragment from the movie um, that he's saying to his interlocutor, to Gomuka, that history always, history is after of Tasha, history always repeats itself. Um, and in a way, like in order to kind of like tackle it or fight it, like now um, I have a baby and he's uh, not even four months, but I decided that I'm going to speak to him in Polish, which is my third language, not even my second. Um, but I kind of want him 
not to lose what my mom and I lost, which is our mother and father tongues. So I kind of like make an effort to grant him something that I was um, unable to have. And it's funny because I make mistakes, but we are learning together with a <coughs> Swavnik, with a dictionary. <laughs> and we speak like that. And I mean, now it's okay because he's not even four months, but I don't know how it's going to be. I'm sorry? Who is we? You and the baby? Yeah. Ah. And I don't know how it's going to be when my baby will be 10 years old. I guess I will have to get him and myself a private teacher again, and we'll see how it goes. But that I think that I made this decision very clear. And I need to correct myself. Sometimes I approach him in Hebrew or in English, and then again I repeat the same thing in Polish because maybe it's artificial, but still I find that this is important. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it kind of like the way that... It, it all, like, all this journey and all my life in Poland, which I miss a lot, um, is being implemented in my new life mm -hmm. um, in America. I think there's a one more question, yeah? Uh, yeah, uh, this, I don't know, this might be a bit of a cliche, but you've been working with the visual and with the language. Do you ever, do you ever see yourself working with the actual different alphabets, like the visual representations of language? Is that, is that like a project you see yourself exploring? Or is that something you've thought about or you know, thought that was much too obvious? Because you know, Yiddish, Yiddish, Hebrew, that's one alphabet. Polish, English, you've got another alphabet. You can delve into the Ukrainian, you have a third alphabet. I'm just curious. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, I now, especially now um, with my baby, um, I am uh, trying to teach him how to read. He's four months, uh, so I just got him a book with the ABC. Uh, we started with English, and hopefully, we'll you know get to more languages um, soon. So, definitely, this is a material because I'm hoping to get you know, back to having like a real studio. Uh, I never really had a physical studio. Uh, I was tra traveling from residency to residency, working at home, um, on trains, everywhere uh, and nowhere at the same time. And so right now um, I'm hoping to finally have um, like a physical space where I can actually like also invite him uh, my baby, who might be coming here actually soon, um, <laughs> probably yeah. Um, so yeah, I I, um, I I would like to take this as a invitation to work with physical representation of different alphabets, definitely. Um, <laughs> right on time. Yeah. <laughs> he Making a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is the baby. <laughs> Well, on, on that okay, one. Oh, one last yeah. question. Um, okay, I'm going to try to formulate it as a question. First of all, I just want to say, um, so yeah, I have known you for quite some time and had the privilege of being with you in Poland during some of the time when you were working on some of these things. It's really so interesting to learn about these projects now in, in such a... Uh, like with so much more depth than we've ever had a chance to because life is going on. Um, and it's making me I wonder, I'm curious because so much of, of this work is created like, um, you know, first of all, primarily based in Europe and very historically site specific. And um, I'm just curious if you, you have you had a lot of transition since you've come here and a lot has been going on. Um, has your time in the U.S. given you any thoughts or ideas on you know work that would be based here? Not to put you on the spot, no. but I, it's like it, it's so grounded in this other place, and I'm, I'm, I'm just curious. You know, if you've given any thought to what? Um, yeah, 
Definitely. Um, there are a couple of things cooking. Um, not um, again. Uh, I'm still on uh, um, maternity leave. Um, no, but I. Uh, I think that oh, what brought. I mean. I'm not based in New York City. I'm based in upstate New York and soon <coughs> going south uh, for a couple of years. Um, so again, there would be some more transitions and I guess I would like to get to know other parts of this country uh, that it's pretty much like the first time, the first time where I, I live here, like really live here because I was born here, but uh, when I was two, my parents left um, with me and then I came here for like a very short time for my studies and then I left again and it's kind of like I'm here already for almost two years, um, still a little bit like isolated and trying like to see um, what is what is going on uh, and learn the scene and I'm um, First of all, super happy and grateful for the opportunity to actually be here uh, tonight. This is um, my first um, like art event that I'm taking part in in the U.S. Um, ever. So this is incredible, and I hope that there would be some reverberations um, to that. But um, but I I feel that. Um, or at least like being in New York, um, I was always, uh, this is this video that I was shooting in Alice Island, I'm always drawn to that place of this margins, you know, the place that will take me out immediately. And so I'm thinking, okay, so Alice Island, and there's this like um, very Hollywood production of the immigrant, uh, it's about this Polish uh, immigrant coming to uh, Alice Island and what happened to her in New York and everything. And I love this movie and somehow like, this kind of you know picturing working around the territories of, of oh. Ellis Island together with the you know a Museum of Immigration in Poland there's kind of this like line that is being drawn between these two places um, and yeah so, so I'm thinking about these directions uh, I'm not leaving Europe I cannot um, and I'm trying to see if I can connect uh, or reconnect to this place while having the baggage of like Europe with me so in these like territories of um, Ellis Island the tenements um, Eldridge Street even. Eldridge Street where I used my, my first apartment in the city um, so <laughs> great yeah. Well, stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. Um, so with that, thank you all so much. Thank you to our hosts.